Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, we talk about some science. Thanks, Doug. Well, we've got some good news for cetacean fans this week, as first of all, there's been the announcement that a skull of a potential new species of Basilosaurus has been discovered in the Okukahe Desert of Peru. The skull is 1.2 meters long and for now is only known as the Okukahe Predator, until an official description is eventually published. During the Eocene period when this ancient whale relative lived, the desert would have been at the bottom of an ancient ocean, with these serpentine-like animals ruling the prehistoric waters. Next up, we have another basilosaurid discovery, with an indeterminate basilosaurid being reported from Russia. Based on several vertebrae coming from Upper Eocene deposits, this is the first instance of basilosaurids in this region of Russia, and the researcher notes that aspects of the lumbar vertebrae suggest this animal differs from other members of the group. So some nice cetacean news there. Also in the news this week is a new paper on Gigantopithecus, the largest primate to ever live. This relative of the orangutan is only known from very incomplete remains, limited to just teeth and mandibles, and in this new paper two more teeth are described from a site in northern Vietnam. This material, a complete right molar 2 and a partial fragment of the crown of a left molar 2, is now the first record of Gigantopithecus in the upper Pleistocene of Vietnam, as well as the second ever record of this primate in the upper Pleistocene at all. The paper therefore suggests that the extinction of Gigantopithecus was probably restricted to the mid to late Pleistocene transition, and that the animals from Vietnam represented by this new material was likely a relict population of the primate that was hanging on as the species went extinct. Well, it's finally happened, the thing you've all been waiting for since the tail paper two years ago, a new Spinosaurus paper. This research, authored by paleontologist Matteo Fabri and a whole team of colleagues, including Dr. Nizar Ibrahim, essentially provides even more evidence in favour of Spinosaurus being a specialist swimming predator of aquatic animals. But not only that, they also find that other Spinosaurids, specifically the British genus Baryonyx, were also swimming waterborne predators that fully submerged under the surface. Describing this mode of life as subaqueous foraging, basically just meaning foraging for food under the water, the paper has analysed thin sections of bones from 206 living amniotes and 174 extinct ones, ranging from other dinosaurs, marine reptiles and cetaceans to pterosaurs and big-bodied terrestrial mammals. This section of the study is likely to be very useful for other researchers, as a large part of the paper explains how they were able to correlate an increase in the bone density of the upper leg bones and the ribs with this subaqueous foraging behaviour. The research explains the caveats that an increase in bone density in big-bodied heavy terrestrial organisms, such as sauropods, is obviously not an indication of aquatic tendencies though, due to other evidence from their overall morphology, with this density increase instead being associated with weight support. Plus, instead of dense bone infilling the cavities in the centres, it's actually a type of spongy bone in these terrestrial organisms. Meanwhile, deep diving aquatic amniotes, such as ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs and cetaceans, actually have a lower bone density in comparison to shallow water subaqueous foragers, as a kind of bone called cancellous bone actually invades the inner part of the bone shafts. Cancellous bone is highly vascularised and not as dense as the type of bone that invades the cavity in the centres of the bones in the shallow water living animals, being thought to help counteract the extreme compression encountered at depths underwater. But again, obviously other aspects of their morphology indicate an aquatic lifestyle in such animals. All this is to say that, essentially, a high bone density was found to be a very good indicator of the initial stages of adaptation to an aquatic lifestyle. However, other aspects of anatomy must then be looked at to distinguish between wading, deep diving or terrestrial habits. So the paper then applied this technique of looking at femur and rib bone densities to non-bird dinosaurs. The paper explains how for a very long time it had been considered that no non-avian dinosaurs had ever adapted to an aquatic niche. This seems sort of strange though when you look at how many times an aquatic lifestyle has arisen in avian dinosaurs, the birds. But this idea has started to change now, with more and more indications of the Spinosaurid dinosaurs being connected to the water. The researchers examined skeletal remains from Baryonyx, Suchomimus, and Spinosaurus itself, with some of these bones being physically thin sectioned and others being CT scanned to reveal the cross sections of their femora and ribs. These cross sections could then be analysed to determine, based on the density of the bone and how much of the internal cavity had been infilled, which the study shows correlates with subaqueous foraging, how likely these dinosaurs are to have been swimming animals. 
Well, they found that the femur of Spinosaurus indicates a median probability of this behaviour of 100%, while the rib has a median probability of 95%. So pretty certain that Spinosaurus was indeed a subaqueous foraging dinosaur, and was fully capable of swimming around underwater in search of prey. Additionally, Baryonyx, perhaps surprisingly, had a median probability of 98% and 96% based on the femur and rib respectively. So, it seems, this study shows that Baryonyx was also a swimming dinosaur that submerged itself in bodies of water to hunt for prey. However, the close relative of Baryonyx, the North African genus Suchomimus, only had a median probability of 31% based on the femur, which is similar to a lot of other terrestrial non-avian dinosaurs. Therefore, Suchomimus does not seem to have been a subaqueous forager. However, considering that its skeleton still displays numerous features that suggest it had a diet consisting mainly of fish, the paper puts forward the idea that Suchomimus was actually a wading animal that hunted its prey from riverbanks, just as others had suggested for Spinosaurus in the past. One of the most interesting things though, is that the study then tentatively proposes that subaqueous foraging was actually ancestral to the Spinosauridae family as a whole, since it's present in both Spinosaurus and Baryonyx. As Suchomimus is so closely related to Baryonyx, it would then have been secondarily lost in this taxon, perhaps as a result of environmental factors leading to fewer rivers or lakes being available to Suchomimus. The researchers also applied the bone density investigation to various other clades of non-bird dinosaurs, finding that, at least for the moment, Spinosaurids appear to be the only grouping that acquired specialist aquatic capabilities. Even other groups that had been proposed to be somewhat aquatic, such as the Hauschkaraptorine dromaeosaurids, were not found to be subaqueous foragers by the study. So, it's a really fascinating paper that definitely provides some useful information on correlating bone density with aquatic habits, across all amniotes. It seems that, as seen in other groups of aquatic amniotes, an increase in bone density was the first step towards an aquatic lifestyle, with other more obvious anatomical changes appearing afterwards. And this appears to be exactly what was happening in Spinosaurids. Well, let me know what you think about this new study in the comments below, I'm interested to see what people make of this. Spinosaurs continue to be one of the most intriguing groups of non-avian theropods, and trust me, there's plenty more to come on Spinosaurus. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it from us this week. I do hope you enjoyed all the science that we both offered you this week in Seven Days of Science, all of the science that we both talked about in this week's Seven Days of Science. I hope you enjoyed this week's Seven Days of Science that we both talked about, and we'll see you on Thursday.